So our first guest speaker is Ms. Jennifer Storm, appointed by the governor as Pennsylvania's victim advocate. In this role, she's responsible for representing the rights and interests of crime victims before the Board of Probation and Parole and the Department of Corrections. She provides notification to crime victims of the potential for inmate release and outlines victim opportunities to provide testimony. Ms. Storm is responsible for advocating the interests of adult and juvenile crime victims throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Prior to this appointment, Ms. Storm served 10 years as executive director of the Dauphin County Victim Witness Assistance Program, a nonprofit organization providing services to crime victims and training in victims' rights and crisis response services. She's the author of several books and articles associated with her personal story of victimization, addiction, and recovery. She's a native of Allentown, uh, Pennsylvania area, and is a graduate of Pennsylvania State University with a master's in organizational management from the University of Phoenix. Please help me uh, welcome Ms. Storm. Good morning, everyone. It's always an odd experience to hear your, your resume read before you. Uh, what I'm here to talk with you about today really is what I often refer to as the unspoken cycle of addiction, victimization, and trauma. Um, as a survivor myself and as a person with long-term recovery, these are not uh, topics that are not only very important to me in terms of my professional life, but obviously within my personal experiences, very passionate about this work. So I'm going to give you a very high-level overview of what is normally probably about an 8 to 10-hour training. Uh, so bear with me today as we kind of move through this. Uh, I, I think the, um, the individual who introduced me did, did a really great job talking about the statistics. I like to open with statistics. I think they're important. Um, and, and I want to congratulate the military for kind of taking the issue of sexual assault, given the national spotlight that has been shown upon you, as seriously as you have in, in the evidence of the numbers that we're looking at up here, but also in the fact that I'm standing before you and we're talking about these issues. And so we have done better. The military has done better. The 25% reporting rate is better. Uh, but as we heard, that still leaves 75% individuals who are not reporting. So there's definitely a lot of work to do. The satisfaction overall with the, the services being provided is at a 73%. Definitely would love to see that in the 90s, right? But we're getting there. It's, it's definitely an improvement over where we were. And I do believe uh, and have faith in the military that we're going to see these numbers um, move up even more. And I want to thank the lovely individual who's flipping my slides for me. Uh, so again, with statistics, I think it's really important that we're talking about sexual violence. These are not individuals who are hiding, right? These are, we often hear, when people hear about rape and sexual violence, they think of that scenario of the person jumping out of the bushes and attacking the person. And that is just simply not the statistics when we're talking about sexual violence and, and, and rape. We're talking about individuals who are known to, their, to the, uh, the victim. So these are just some statistics on that, that 82% of all sexual assaults were perpetrated by a non-stranger. We're talking 47% of these rapists were a friend or an acquaintance, 25% were someone they were intimate with already, 5% have been a relative. Uh, more than 50% of all incidents were reported by victims to have occurred within one mile of their home or in their actual home. 7% of these are taking place in the actual victim's home, 13% in the home of a neighbor, friend, or relative, 18% are still taking place in parking garages. That statistic always still baffles me. 43% uh, of these are taking place between 6 p.m. and midnight. So I want you to think what also typically happens between 6 p.m. and midnight. It's the time we're social, it's happy hour, it's the time we're going out to bars, we're at social engagements, we're at parties. So alcohol plays a significant role in the majority of the sexual assaults that occur. And the, the cycle of that is what we're gonna talk about today. my lovely graphic of the cycle. Again, I, I don't think um, in, in most of our fields we connect or link the cycle of trauma, addiction, and victimization enough. These are definitely three entities that go together that we need to be looking at, that we need to be assessing. Um, and, and in order to really fully holistically treat a survivor, we need to be looking at all three of these components. So every single victim of sexual violence experiences to some level stress trauma or acute stress disorder. Um, most, some will go on to experience post-traumatic stress disorder, which you are all more familiar with probably in terms of war, 
but r rape victims also experience this at a high rate. Um, so every single victim that you encounter is going to experience at some level some type of acute stress trauma. Um, it can also be experienced by the, their loved ones, the family members, those who have witnessed the violence themselves, those who have intervened. Um, so it's really important to understand that when responding to sexual assault victims and rape victims, you're dealing with individuals who are suffering from acute stress trauma. I'm going to talk about why that's really important the brain. Uh, so I could talk about neuroscience and neurobiology for hours and hours, uh, and it's very exciting to me that we're, we're in a day and age where we're really starting to connect the way that the brain, the way that our biology responds to trauma, because it's really, really important in understanding why victims react the way they do, why individuals behave the way they do, and in, in order to tailor your services and your response sensitively and properly, it's really vital that you understand this. So we're just going to do the real simple kind of brain chemistry with you today. When an individual experiences trauma, it literally disconnects their left side of the brain from the right side of the brain. So it's disconnecting that left side, which is where we kind of have logic, analytical thinking, right? And it's separating it from that right side, which is where we experience and express emotion. What's also really important, and anyone who has teenagers in their home gets this, it takes the frontal lobe offline. You know, we often hear about adolescence development, why many of our adolescents are deemed kind of legally crazy, and that's because their frontal lobe their cognitive thinking is offline during those years. Not during the whole course of those years, but at some point it's offline. So they're not making healthy decisions. They're not, re they're not able to understand consequence as opposed to action. That exact same process happens when an individual experiences trauma as well. So why is this important? It's important when you're responding to a person who has experienced trauma to understand that they are not going to react they're not going to be able to speak to you. They're not going to, in some ways, come across as a reasonable person whose brain is not traumatized. Their brain is literally in that moment disconnected, offline and traumatized. So their verbiage may be odd. They may not be able to express to you in a linear fashion what happened to them. They're going to give you their story in odd kind of blurps, bits and pieces. Um, they're going to be feeling all of this stuff that the right side of the brain feels, but they're not going to be able to connect that to logic. They're not going to be able to say to you, this is what happened to me, this is how I feel about it, this was my experience. It's really important to understand that because it really goes a long way in terms of victim response, blaming the victim, sensitive response. Um, as, if you, as long as you know that the person in front of you has experienced brain damage, I mean, it's temporary, but to some degree, their brain is not operating the same way that you and I do. It's really important in terms of your approach and your response to that victim. Something that's really also important is to understand that that victim's perception is their reality, right? So all of us have had... Um, tons of experience in our lives, right? That color every single decision, every single experience that we have, it colors the way that we experience things. So while I may experience an incident this, at the same exact time as your experience an incident, our experiences may be very different, may be vastly different. We hear this when we see the news, right? Firsthand accounts of something that may have occurred. Everyone kind of has a different story, don't they? Everyone has viewed an incident differently. Someone may experience something that we would, that I would think is horribly traumatizing, and they're like, yeah, it was fine, I'm, I'm fine. So it really, it, the perception of the trauma is really what's important here, not what you think that had happened, or not how you feel that person should have perceived or responded to an incident. And it's really important, again, when we're talking about sexual violence, because there's so much victim blaming in our culture, right? We do have this kind of rape culture in our society where we immediately assign blame to a victim. We immediately start saying, well, why was she there? Why did he go there? Why were they alone? Why did they drink? Why, 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 why? And it's because we're perceiving what happened to them. We have a saying in victim services where we meet our victims where they are. And that is that we understand that the perception that they have in that moment of what experience to them is our reality. And that's the reality that we're going to operate with, right? Not where we want them to be, not where we think they should be, and certainly not where we think we would be in that moment. So just some normal responses to traumatic or abnormal events. We often tell people you're having a very normal reaction to an abnormal event. Um, because usually when people experience trauma, 
the first thing they start to say is, I, I can't believe I'm experiencing this. I can't believe I feel this way. And they immediately are flooded with shame, guilt, right? They, they want anything more than just to start feeling kind of normal again. And so it's really important to start normalizing these abnormal experiences that they're having. Um, so some of the common, very, very common experiences are guilt and self-blame are really with sexual assault victims, the first things that flood into our body. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this. Haven't met a survivor of sexual violence yet who hasn't expressed some sort of guilt and or blame. Self-blame, which is, is really important in terms of when we talk about recovery. Anxiety, edginess, mood swings, irritability, feeling disconnected or numb, right? Again, that goes to the brain. They're not, they're not able to connect why they're feeling a certain way. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about, too, the brain. That, the brain can stay that way just in the immediate aftermath of the victimization. It could reoccur at times when there are triggering events, or, or it could stay that way for a long period of time. And that's, that's when we get into post-traumatic stress disorder diagnoses. Um, distressing memories about the event, insomnia, bad dreams, withdrawing from others, loss of appetite, difficulty concentrating, feeling sad or hopeless. These are very common responses. So when we talk about shame, I, I learned something a couple years ago that just floored me, but it really, really helped me understand on a very kind of cellular level this issue of shame and the connection to addiction and the connection to healing and recovery. And that is that shame is experienced in the body in the exact same way as a significant traumatic event. So what I mean by that is shame's really not an emotion. It's more biological. And, and the way that the individual... Um, explain this to me was that if you take two individuals, and I didn't have time to put all the brain slides up here, if you take two individuals, one person who was, was raped and is feeling the shame of that rape, and you take that person's brain and you compare it to a brain of someone who just got hit by a truck, their brains are going to biologically look identical. And so it really hit me that, oh, this makes a lot of sense. Shame is this incredibly powerful, powerful experience that sexual violence survivors have, and it's biological. It's why survivors are, look for reasons to kind of get out of that, to kind of quell that pain. And addiction is one of those ways that, that survivors do that. Reaching for pills, reaching for alcohol, in some instances reaching for a razor blade to cut, right? We know that that's a common coping mechanism for survivors. So when I learned this, it just it really hit home to me that this makes a lot of sense. When your brain is biologically experiencing something of that magnitude, it's not unrational to, to look for something to help you deal with that. And oftentimes, substances are those things. Unfortunately, oftentimes, those are the things your doctor's prescribing in the hospital, right? If you're, if you're going in and you're presenting with all the different experiences that I listed before, many doctors are going to say, we'll give you a Xanax, give you a you know, Valium, whatever it is they prescribe these days. And that becomes the mechanism, which can then lead to an addictive, an addictive behavior. But it's really all about trying to create a new normal in your life and to try to not feel this kind of shame, which can be incredibly intensely felt. So again, for a normal response to an abnormal event, you're talking simply symptoms are usually going to fade a few days to a few months after the incident. So most crime victims, and I'm going to probably go as far as to say all crime victims, all rape victims are going to experience acute stress disorder to some degree. It's gonna vary, because obviously as we talked about, people's, person, people's experiences color the way that they experience the world. It's also gonna color the way that they deal with certain, um, certain events. They're gonna, so all people are gonna experience a litany of those. Um, if, if they start to feel better, usually this is gonna be a few days to a few months. The key to this though is that there are, there are resurgence of that experience. And those are what we call in the field triggers. So it's really important when you're working with a survivor to truly understand the experience that they had and to know and to prepare them for what is ahead. So things like anniversaries of the assault. Um, if they were assault location, I'm kind of going in and out here, sorry. Um, the very, you know, walking past that building could be a trigger for them. Uh, one good example is this. Let's say a sexual assault victim is, is assaulted at a house party and there's a song that's blasting, right, while the, while the assault is happening. They could, months later, be shopping in Giant and walking down aisle four and that song comes on and all of a sudden they are literally on the ground in the fetal position, their adrenaline is going, their heart is palpitating, they're flooded with all of those same intense emotions and if they weren't prepared for the fact that that song in and of itself could be a trigger, they're going to think they're going crazy, right? They're going to think they're having a panic attack. 
what our job is, what the responsibility of those responding to survivors is, is to prepare the victims for it. We can't take away all those feelings that they may experience and probably will experience when that song comes on, but if we can prepare them, it helps to normalize it so that they're like, okay, this is, the song's on, so this is why I'm feeling this way. I'm not crazy, I, I'm, I'm okay. And then we help to give them resources to help them try to rebalance themselves in that moment. Triggers are very, very powerful. They literally can take an individual back to the same exact feelings they had at the time of the assault or the immediate aftermath of the assault. And that's normal. You guys experience it with post-traumatic stress disorder or acute stress disorder with soldiers, right? A, a, a tire popping on the Carlisle Pike could send a soldier right back to Afghanistan, right? It's the exact same experience. So we, we try to talk with victims about experiencing life in this new normal. It's really, really important, and I cannot stress this enough, that a sexual assault survivor is never going to be the exact same as they were prior to the assault, right? Our role is to get them to a healthy, healing place, but part of that is to start talking with them that there's a new normal in your life. Um, the event will never not not be in your history, where right? You can get to a place that, that's wonderful and healing. You know, my assault occurred when I was 12 years old, so we're talking decades ago. There is still not a day that goes by that in some, some realm that I'm not reminded that I was raped when I was 12 years old. And it's not always in a negative way. Sometimes it's in an empowering way, right? Because I'm standing before you and I'm able to carry a message to you, and that's because I had this experience. But it's never unlearned. It's never, it never, it just never unhappens. So I have this world where I live in a new normal. Every survivor is going to experience this to some degree. Some of them are going to be, you know, much different than their past lives. Some are going to be maybe just slightly altered. But every single survivor that you work with is going to be dealing with a new normal. Um, so things that you never want to say to a survivor <laughs> in terms of sensitive responses, when are you going to get over this? It's been, it's been months. It's been years. Are you still talking about this? What, you know, why haven't you gotten over this? Very damaging things to say to a survivor of sexual assault because th there is never closure. Closure often is this, like, this lovely word that we like to use in society that you know, wraps things up in a, in a nice little package and puts a bow on it and it fixes things. And that's just not the reality for people who have experienced trauma in any way. There is really no such thing as closure. There may be phases where things have healed Right, and, and we talk about this with victims during the court processes. Um, you know, this process could be a transformation process where we get to sentencing, where the accounter, the the offender, may be held accountable. That's a transition for that victim. Certainly not closure. It just means a new door is opening that they're walking through in a new and different way. Um, so really important to be real mindful of the language that we use when talking with survivors and to try to understand that you know it's it's just never going to be the same for them and and living within that reality. So we talked about what not to say, really important things to say, that you believe them. Um, we often hear, you know, the, the issue of, of sexual violence and rape has become so escalated and, and we're at such a national level with talking and dialoguing about violence, which is wonderful. It's, it's as a survivor and an advocate myself, I couldn't feel like I'd be living in a better time in terms of creating awareness. But with that also comes backlash, right? And we hear about, well, what about the false reports? What about the false reports? I'm going to say this to you that less than 2% of all reported rapes and sexual assaults are false. Less than 2% less than 2%. And I'm gonna ask you that if you have one of those less than 2% in front of you, that you still treat that person with compassion and love and support because I can guarantee that there's something else going on with them. Because people don't just raise their hand and say I was raped. Because as you see from the headlines and the experiences, it's not fun to be a rape survivor in this society. You are looked at, you are analyzed, you are under a microscope at all times. It's always about the victim, never about the accused. Um, so to please believe them, even if they end up being one of those less than 2%. Obviously that it's not their fault. It's never someone's fault, right? It doesn't matter what you wore, what you did, what you said, what you drank, where you were. It's never a victim's fault. It's not okay to sexually violate another person's body. It's just never okay. I don't care if they were intoxicated. I don't care if they were blacked out. I don't care if they you know, started kissing you and then said no and you thought, well, they started. It's never okay, that they're not alone. It's so incredibly important that survivors know that there's support.
that there are there's a community that they can engage. There is there is truly strength in numbers when it comes to victims of sexual assault. And nothing proved this more to me than I, I was one of the advocates on the Jerry Sandusky case. And it wasn't until there were several identified young men that some of those other young men felt comfortable coming forward because they knew they weren't going to be alone. They knew that there was going to be more. It was it was an army, if you will. And unfortunately, that's what it took to take him down. Victims need to know that there's support, that they're, that they're not alone. Reassuring their personal safety is vital, especially in closed quarters such as military bases, college campuses, that if and when they do report and their offender is, is within the near proximity, that you can assure their safety because that could be a barrier for them to reporting. Um, and obviously that there's help. Be knowledgeable of the resources that you have. Know the names of the wonderful individuals here who provide these services so that when you're working with a survivor, you can immediately say, there's help here. We, we have support. And, and this is what it looks like. So let's talk about the effects of sexual assault and rape. Victims of sexual assault are three times more likely to suffer from depression, six times more likely to suffer from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, 13 times more likely to abuse alcohol, 26 times more likely to abuse drugs, and four times more likely to contemplate suicide. And I, I will tell you that I believe very strongly that goes back to that shame response that feeling, that need of getting out of yourself. I can very much tell you from firsthand experience, when I was 12 years old and I was raped, I had zero resources. I did not have an advocate. I didn't have parents that understood it, so they just didn't talk about it, right? Everyone kind of walked around me as though I was this glass pane that was gonna shatter at any moment. I had no help, but I felt inside just horrible. Right? Every single thing that I knew about my life had radically changed. I didn't recognize myself when I looked in the mirror. All I felt was utter shame and guilt and blame. And I thought the reason my family was acting so strangely around me, of course, was just my fault. Right? It was all my fault. That led me to suffer from depression. It led me to reach for drugs and alcohol so that I could just silence it for a minute, so that I could feel comfortable enough to walk through my life, to sit through a class. It it pushed me towards cutting because for some uh, for some reason that I still am fascinated by, it felt like a release for me. It helped me cope in that moment. I was every single one of these statistics. It led me to abusing drugs. I became a crack addicted person at the age of 16. Um, you know, it led me to contemplate suicide, and then it, it actually culminated in my suicide attempt, which did save my life at age 22. So I was a poster child for all these statistics, but there wasn't a poster back then. Nobody knew what I was experiencing. Um, and unfortunately, I was having what is pretty much a normal response to surviving a sexual violent attack. So what are some of the reasons we use, right? I think I just kind of captured all that, but it's, it's this need to feel better. It's this need to eliminate that feeling of unworthiness, that feeling that comes with shame, with guilt, with self-blame. It's to quell the, the pain, right? If you talk with most individuals who, who use or abuse drugs or even individuals who, who attempt suicide, they're really not trying to die. They're not trying to kill themselves. I was never trying to kill myself. I was trying to kill the pain. I just wanted to feel normal again. And unfortunately, these really negative coping mechanisms enabled me in those moments to feel normal because I didn't have anyone in my life who said, well, this is a healthy coping mechanism or I know what you're going through. I didn't have an advocate. Fortunately, today, we are flooded with resources so that I'm, I'm, I am prayful that most youth will not have to experience what I experienced, at least not to the degree that I did because we have support. But it's really this trying to just quell the pain. Try to get through another day. Try to sit through science class without the flood of the memories, without the feelings, without just feeling so incredibly uncomfortable. So it's a very common response. So again, we talked about acute stress disorder and that really lasting between three days to one month. That's normal, that's common. Most survivors are gonna experience that. It's when we start getting into longer than three months or when you're working or dealing with someone who has really, it appears, has experienced none of those stress reactions, but maybe six months later, all of a sudden, they're experiencing all of them. That's when we need to start looking at trying to get a professional diagnosis for post-traumatic stress disorder, because that is most likely what's happening with that individual at that time. What's really important to understand is that I know when we think about PTSD, we think about war, right? Especially in this room, you think about war, you think about the horrific things that soldiers see day in and day out and experience. It's really important to understand that rape is the second leading cause of PTSD. 
Um, so it, it is right up there. And it's not just experienced by the survivor themselves. It can be experienced by their family, by their loved ones, by law enforcement, first responders, advocates who respond to this day in and day out. Um, it's really important to be mindful that sometimes it's not just the survivor who's experiencing this. It could be their family members and close loved ones. And to those of us who are responding to it. So symptoms of PTSD, we're just going to kind of briefly go through this. Um, it's going to be that re-experiencing of the traumatic event, right? So if it's anything over that three-month period, or if it's all of a sudden kind of coming on six months or more out, then it's probably PTSD. And it's kind of similar to the acute, but it's going to be that per pervasive re-experiencing. So intrusive, upsetting memories, flashbacks, nightmares, feeling intense distress when reminded of the event. So that's with those triggers that we discussed, right, when the song comes on having that extreme response, um, and intense physical reminders, you know, your pounding of your head, your, your, your pulse racing, all those same biological responses that you experience at the time of the incident will resurge during uh, moments of PTS, PTSD. What's really important when working with somebody who may be utilizing drugs and alcohol in these moments, these are the moments they're going to use the most. These are the times that they're going to want to escape the most, that they're going to reach for a negative coping mechanism. So if you're working with someone who's in, a, who's in recovery from addiction and is experiencing this, it's really important to talk about um, relapse prevention, right? It's important to get all those tools out that you know that people with addictions deal with, getting them to meetings, finding a support person, and just being cognizant that at these times this, there, there may be a resurgence of their addiction. Um, obviously, hyper hyper arousal. We, um, I think that you're very very um, used to this term in, in the military. It's that kind of being on the defense at all times, right? Being being ready at all times. Um, that's not a that's not a normal state of being, right? It's not a healthy biological state of being either, because it means that your adrenaline is at, at the top at all times, and everything in your body is not functioning properly when you are in a hyper arousal state. Uh, concentration, falling asleep, easily startled, feeling uh, tense, feeling on edge, being very angry, having angry outbursts. Really important to, to know these things as you're working with survivors because as you're working with them and you're taking them through their healing process, whatever that looks like for you, it's important to be mindful of this so that you understand that their behavior is directly linked to the incident. Uh, avoiding activities, places, feelings that remind you of the trauma, that's very common for victims. That can be really challenging, especially if a victimization occurred at their workplace or on a military base or on a college campus, if that's a place that they have to frequent uh, by the very essence of their job or their, or their study. Um, so it's really important to be mindful of that and to help safety plan around that. Uh, inability to remember certain aspects of the trauma. Again, this gets back to that kind of broken brain, right? It's not uncommon for a victim of sexual violence to not be able to tell you their story, and it's certainly not from start to finish with all the details that you want. It's the reason we have what's called expert witness testimony, finally, in the state of Pennsylvania, so that we can have experts that can take the witness stand and explain to a juror why a survivor's memory may be fractured why they can't tell you in a linear fashion what happened to them, why there might be certain details that might be inconsistent or deemed inconsistent, because they might have remembered something here, but then forgot it here, but then remembered another piece of their story here. I can tell you that in the, what, 20-some years that I've been telling my story, it never comes out the same. It's pretty consistent now, you know, because I've been able to kind of heal and I understand what happened. There's always little pieces of that shattered experience that I pick up along the way, and even 25 years later, it fascinates me. Loss of interest in activities and life in general, again, feeling detached and emotionally numb. This is, seeing your, your future as limited, um, that, that's a really common experience. So it, it, can, it can certainly make one think that, oh, this person might be suicidal because they may be talking in, like they don't see a future. They're not seeing a light at, at the end of the tunnel. And it's really just a common experience of PTSD. It might not be that the person is suicidal in that moment. It's just this concept of not understanding a, a future. Um, when I was raped at, at 12, for whatever reason, I, I didn't think I could have kids. I thought, well, I'm never going to be able to have kids. And there was no biological reason. Like the, the, when I had my exam, it wasn't like they said something was, something was wrong to that degree. But it was this feeling. It was this feeling of loss that, oh, well, that's probably something that will never happen. Never thought I'd graduate. Never thought I'd become anything. It's this kind of limited sense of reality. And again, this is when relapse prevention is so important. When you're working with someone who's experiencing any of these, it's really important that if you know that alcohol or drugs or any other negative coping mechanism, that can be food, it can be sex, it can be anything that they're doing in an ex extreme or in excess that is not helpful or, or healing for them, it's really important to, to talk with them about resources and available resources.
So stress trauma disorders have been estimated to occur as high as 60 to 80% of the substance abusing population. So why is this important? I keep talking about relapse prevention. I keep talking about negative coping mechanisms. It's because we know that such a significant portion of the substance abusing population has experienced trauma on some level. Now, it might not be a victimization, but they have experienced some type of trauma. So it's important. So why is this important for today? If you're working with somebody who all of a sudden is just starting to drink, or you see that they're getting out of hand, maybe they're, um, they are extremely bulimia, bulimic, and you're noticing a, a significant change in, in their eating patterns, or you're noticing a significant change in their, in their addiction and their abuse, most likely 60 to 80% of the time, that person has experienced some type of trauma or victimization. So when you're going to look for resources and try to assist that person, it's really important to understand that, right? Because it's this cycle. And that cycle can absolutely continue and often does because we ignore one spoke on that cycle. You can't just treat the addiction if you miss the trauma, right? Because you're not gonna really treat the addiction. What you'll be doing is putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole. So for many individuals, the bullet hole is the wound. It's the initial experience of the trauma. It's their initial experience of the victimization, whatever that is. For me, at 12 years old, it was the fact that I was raped, right? It was like I had this gaping wound inside me that I, I, you know, nobody really saw unless I told them. And I put a Band-Aid over that by using drugs and alcohol. That was my coping mechanism. Got me through for several years, was very destructive, did, was not beneficial. When I got into treatment, had someone just taken that Band-Aid off and said, okay, we're just going to treat the addiction, would I have recovered? No. Because the reason I was putting that Band-Aid on was because I had this gaping wound. You've got to be able to clean the wound. You've got to be able to heal the wound in order to really fully sustain somebody in long-term recovery from addiction. Um, this slide disturbs me every single time that I use it. Um, and I, most, I just updated it actually this week. It's one of the reasons I had to send an update um, because I went to make sure, fact check all my stats, make sure they were accurate. And this stat actually got worse. The last time I used it, it was actually a little bit better. So it's quite alarming to me that it got worse. Um, but this right here just shows you why people are fearful of reporting. It's why our statistics are so low. It's why people choose to use drugs and alcohol and negative coping mechanisms to deal. And that is because out of every 100 rapes that happen, 32 of them are going to get reported to the police. Seven of those 32 are going to lead to an arrest. Three are going to get referred for prosecution. Of those three, two will lead to a felony conviction, which means two people will serve time in jail. The other 98 individuals are going to walk free. This should alarm you and disturb you beyond anything else you hear today. Because this is why. This is why we stay silent. This is why victims don't feel comfortable coming forward. This is why perpetrators and offenders are still offending and perpetrating at the levels that they are because they also know these statistics exist. We can make a difference. So not to get you too doomsday, I do, do really believe that we are going to have an impact on these statistics. I think that the general awareness that we're creating, the dialogues that we're having, the fact that we're sitting here today talking about this, that a room full of people who are in leadership positions are talking about this and getting educated on this will eventually have an impact on this. At least that is my hope. So what's, what's a way that you can impact kind of these negative coping mechanisms, and, we're, and today we're really more focusing on substance abuse, is trying to create awareness, having events like this today, talking about what happens when we have societies that are saturated in drug and alcohol addiction. And unfortunately, whether you want to admit it or not, military bases are well known for binge drinking. Alcohol is a known coping mechanism for the traumas and what that you endure in and out of the field. So we need to be mindful that when we have environments where this behavior is happening, we need to be mindful that we are creating fuel for offenders. And then we are creating places where victims are going to happen. Victimization is going to happen. We need to understand that we're increasing the vulnerability of crime and that we're increasing the vulnerability to predators to commit those crimes. So we just need, you need to be mindful. When you're, when you're talking, when you're engaging in your, with your soldiers, when you're looking at social activities, when you're looking at your bases, be mindful of this kind of binge drinking mentality. I do a lot of work on college campuses. I'm going to King's College this Saturday to talk to their incoming freshmen. I'm always there the second day that they're there, and the second day that I'm there, someone is always in the hospital with alcohol poisoning, and someone has already been assaulted. It's so incredibly important because what happens on college campuses, binge drinking, right? Same environment that happens in the military. Sometimes it's the first experience that a young person has had with independence, with freedom, 
And, and it's our society, right? It's the way that we kind of, it's the way that we party. So it's really important to be mindful that you're training individuals about this. Not saying that abstinence is what they need to engage in, but just understanding consent, understanding alcohol, understanding binge drinking, and understanding the environment that you're in. So you're empowering everyone in the room, not just the victims, but also the potential offenders. They need to be just as informed, if not more informed, than the, than the potential victims about what consent is and when it can be given and when it can't and what, how alcohol plays into that. So I kind of kind of went over this again. Environments where substance abuse is permitted, which which we just talked about, um, working on making sure that that blame is not a part of your culture. Attacking rape culture at the front. What you're doing. You're having this event here today. Um, really making sure that you have resources for those with substance abuse order, disorders. There are still, there's still a significant stigma attached to those people with addiction, right? We believe that they're not worthy of treatment, that what happened to them is a result of their, their negative behavior. Uh, we have this kind of tendency to look down upon people who, who use drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism. Um, when really we should be lifting those people up because they have experienced some trauma in their life that needs healed. And that's why they're, that's why they're engaging that behavior. So we need to make sure that the policies that we have, the programs that we have are inclusive of that, they're informed of that, um, and that people feel and believe that they have a place that they can go where they're not going to be judged or stereotyped. So what's the best approach? Obviously acknowledging that this cycle exists acknowledging that addiction, trauma, and victimization often go hand in hand. So when you're dealing with one of these issues, being mindful of the other. So if you're dealing with an individual who's just experienced a significant trauma, preparing them, understanding that substance abuse may be uh, something that they enter into at some point. So being mindful of that, educating them about the risks of, of addiction, the risks of, of negative of engaging in negative coping mechanisms, and providing them alternatives, finding healthy coping mechanisms, helping them to understand that what's happening to them is going to lead them possibly to reach for something that they may never have reached for, right? Which could start as, as Valium and could end up as heroin as we're seeing so much in our society right now. So being informed about that. On the flip side of that, if you're dealing with somebody who has addictions and you're looking at disciplinary action, maybe trying to probe a little bit further, trying to find out what is maybe what is that wound, what is the source, why are you doing this, and getting them the help and the assistance that they need. So we're dealing with both. There used to be this really damaging scientific belief that for addicts, once you put them in treatment, if you dealt with the trauma at the same time, that there would be a significant failure rate. Thankfully, we've, we've had researchers that have gone back and said that's, that's absolutely inaccurate, that if you don't deal with the trauma, you're not going to fully be able to deal with the substance abuse and vice versa. Obviously, educating yourself uh, about client services, having recovery groups on base is important having AA meetings, NA meetings, whatever other supportive services you can have so that it's accessible, right? So that people don't have to go to great lengths to get help so that it's right at their door. When you have communities like this where people are living here, that you know, this is they live and breathe this, this reality, the resources that they need then should be right here. Just as you have a grocery store, you should have a support group. You should have an AA meeting. You should have an NA meeting. Um, and again, that it just takes every single toolbox in, 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 the, uh, in the belt that, to prevent relapse. I often talk of recovery as a muscle. Healing is a muscle. And if a muscle isn't exercised frequently, it loses itself, right? It, it kind of, you lose, you lose the muscle. But what's great about muscles is they have great memory. So the minute you start re-engaging resources or you start re-engaging a, a weight, your muscle remembers that and it strengthens itself. Same goes for recovery and healing. Like, apparently I wanted to really highlight that and underline that. <laughs> so real quick, I'm going to talk about victim advocacy. Um, super, super important that you understand that you have advocates on base, that you have connections with local rape crisis centers, such as the, the agencies that PCAR have. Um, it's really important that people understand the criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system, any type of justi justice system is very scary for people who have never had to experience it. If you're not a criminal justice major, um, or if you haven't been through some type of court proceeding or some type of police proceeding, it's very intimidating, it's very scary. We can lessen the impact of that experience if there's somebody there who knows power that survivor. Um, Fortunately, in Pennsylvania, we have a wonderful set of victims' rights. The three most important things, though, that every single victim in the Commonwealth should have at all times is to be treated with dignity, sensitivity, and respect. 
That's the core, it's the fundamental, it's the beginning line of the Crime Victims Act in Pennsylvania. Um, it's, it's what we wanna see as the standard, um, and, and it's incredibly important. And again, that that is regardless of gender, age, marital status, race, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, disability, religion, regardless, that person should be treated with dignity, sensitivity, and respect. Just some of the basic rights that crime victims have. They have the right to be told. They have the right to be told what's happening. They have the right to basic services, what's happening in your case, when the court event's happening, when the offender, if and when the offender's been apprehended, where they're being apprehended, if there's bail. They have the right to be um, told all of that. They have the right to receive. They have the right to receive notice of the arrest of the offender. They have the right to restitution, which is a financial remedy that the courts can order for the crime victim. They have the right to understand that there is also compensation available through the crime victim's compensation fund within the Pennsylvania Commission of Crime and Delinquency. They have the right to be accompanied to any and all proceedings, right? If they're being taken to the hospital for a rape exam, there should be an advocate there with them. If they're being, if they're being asked to come to court and testify, there should be a support person or an advocate there with them. What that person's role is, is to help prepare them emotionally to provide information and to provide support. That way it's not as scary, right? It's, it's not as intimidating if you know what's gonna happen and you have somebody there guiding you through it. And they have the right to provide input. Unfortunately, it's albeit limited right to provide input, but there is a right to provide input. Most victims have the right to provide input at the time of sentencing or at the time of disposition. They have the right to give what's called a victim impact statement. It's truly really the only voice that the victim has in any type of criminal or juvenile proceeding. You know, they, they have to sit by and watch this whole court process go as the offender has 80 million rights. And it isn't until the very end, until the case has been disposed of, that they then have the right to get up in court and actually give their, their day, their voice. Um, also at the state level with the office that I run, the Office of the Victim Advocate, they have the right to provide input to the parole board. So we now have a process whereby victims can come into the parole board and they can give input. We don't have parole hearings like you see on television. Um, we have parole board members that go out to institutions, they interview offenders, they never really sit as one. So you're never gonna come to the parole board and see all nine parole board members there making a decision that just doesn't happen that way. It's logistically in Pennsylvania, it's impossible. So what they're doing is they're out at the various institutions they're assigned at, they're meeting with offenders, and then there's one day a month where we bring them all into the parole board and two of them at a time will meet with victims who are associated with the same case that they've met with the offenders on and that it helps to inform their decision. We see about 1,200 victims a year. Um, this process was created two years ago. You have a question? Do you know at this point, is that, is that an option for crime victims? I saw you shaking your head, so I'm calling you. No. Okay. If it's not, it should be. Um, understanding, obviously, that, that our statute might not always dictate the process that the military go, adheres to, it should be, because this is also a federal right for crime victims. Okay, yeah, because our, our rights model the Federal Bill of Rights for Crime Victims, and this is absolutely a right for, for victims at the federal level, so it should be a right and an option anytime you're having any type of disposition proceeding. The victim should have the right to be present and should have the right to provide a statement. I can help you with that, though, if you need a sample policy. Um, ag again, this is just kind of getting, getting through what I was talking about. You know, the core experiences of psychological trauma are disempowerment and disconnection, right? So recovery has to be based upon empowerment of the survivor. It has to be creating those connections. It has to be about lifting people up. You're not going to be able to heal an individual if you're disempowering them, if you're not giving them a voice at certain proceedings. Um, we have to be empowering survivors, and we have to be lifting them up. I always like to throw in some good graphics, so my last couple graphics are kind of the way I want to see the world. You know, we, we have right now in our society, and I would, I would propose to you that it's not as clean cut as it is like 50-50 here on this slide, that we're probably more 70 over there, maybe 30 here, but I think this, this side over here is growing. This is the world that I want to live in. I don't know about you. I want to live in a place where I genuinely believe people, where I lift them up, I provide them with resources, I help them spiritually, emotionally, physically, psychologically. That's the society that I want to live in. I don't want to live in that place where we're blaming people, where we're constantly speculatively looking at people's motives. Um, I want to live in this place, and I hope you do too.
So we'll end with some funny. <laughs> it's important to lift people up. It's important to tell people that they can survive, that there is life beyond the victimization. Even though it might not be that new normal, right? It's going to be this new normal. It can be amazing. At, tw at, eight, at 12 years old, if you would have told me that I was standing in front of you today with the accolades that I have and the life that I've been able to live, I would never have believed you because I didn't have that person telling me. But I am. You know, my life exceeds my expectations every day, and I am blessed by the experiences that I've had. Um, could I go, would, I, would I choose to go back and change it? Yeah, because it wasn't a great experience, but I have to tell you that the life that I have today and the support that I have been able to garner has made me feel like I'm pretty awesome, and I want every survivor in this world to feel that they're awesome. And when they don't, I send them this. Because it makes you smile, right? There's nothing, like babies are great, right? So it's so important to remind victims that even in their darkest hour, there is hope, that they are strong, that they are believed, they're supported, they're empowered. Someday maybe we'll get to that place where those scales are actually balanced. We're not there yet, but I'd like to, I put that up there as an ideal. So finally, what you can do in order to encourage that is you can be a seed planner. Realizing that not everyone in this room is going to be the person providing services to, to victims of sexual violence, but every single one of you, are, you're here because you're in some type of leadership capacity. So you have the ability to be a seed planner. You have the ability to be informed, to be educated about these issues, and to impart that knowledge on everyone you're around, right? To be a positive role model, to live in that society where we're lifting people up, where we're believing each other and we're supporting each other. Again, even if one of those people is the less than 2%, we're still going to lift that person up because something's happening. We want that person to be healthy. We want them to be help, happy. So I, I want to be in that type of world. And so seed planters, a lot of people, when we talk about addiction, addiction is really hard. How many of you in here know somebody who has an addiction? It's a lot. Um, it, there, it's really, really hard, right? You can't fix an addict. If you've ever tried to fix an addict, then you know. It's, it's, it's impossible, right? That person has to be able to realize their own addiction. They have to be able to heal themselves. It's very similar with any type of psychological trauma or any type of issue, right? The person's got to be able to, to have the will. The person's got to be able to do it themselves. They need support, and they need you, and they need your resources. So it's so important that you are the seed planners. And that person, you might plant a seed in someone's brain, and they, it might not take root, and they might not get it. And you might see that person 5, 10, 15 years later, and then they're coming back to you and saying, oh, man, I remember you. You came into my class. You spoke to me. You, you, know, you told me that you believe survivors. And I didn't, really, I didn't really hear it then, but I get it now. And thank you for saying that to me because I never. And I can tell you that once somebody learns something, once something is unlearned, it's really, really, really hard to unlearn it, right? So it's so important to be a positive seed planner, to know that even if you change the life of one person, you've done your job. And that's what I want you to be. And that's why I thank you for having me here today. Hopefully I was able to plant some seeds for you to help you be those people for, the, um, for, for those that you're encountering each and every day. Um, if you have any questions, I can certainly take those if we have time. Time allows. Yes, sir. <laughs> what are you going to do to change it? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's because we live in this society where we don't believe victims. We don't empower them. We don't support them. We immediately blame them. We immediately as uh, assign suspicion to them. Uh, so we don't have the reporting that we need, right? So that's why only 32 of them of the 100 get reported. Um, so we need to change that. We need to change the stigma. We need to start talking about why people offend. We need to start talking about what we can do to raise young men, and, I, and I'm going to just focus on men for a second, even though I'm very, very well informed that women also uh, violate and offend. We need to raise young men who understand consent, who understand sexuality, who understand what healthy sexual behavior is. And those mean really tough conversations, conversations that people don't want to have, right? And they start at the dinner table, and they, and they should be in the classroom, and they should be in every single entity that that young person is. I remember going to, um, I think it was Michigan State University, and they wanted me to come talk to their athletic department about sexual assault and share my story. So I was like, yeah, because, you know, we have an issue in athletics, right? This is, it's not uncommon. We have a higher rate of sexual violence in athletics. And they said, okay, well, we're going to have you meet with all the females, um, and then you'll meet with the coaches, and then, you know, we'll take you to the, to the plane. And I'm like, 
well, what about the men? Like, I, I want to talk to the to the athletes, right? <laughs> and, and they and they didn't get it. They said, oh, we thought we just wanted to talk with the with the you know potential victims. I said, no, I want to talk to the potential offenders too. I, I want to help empower young men so that they don't make really stupid judgment decisions that end up destroying their lives, right? If I'm going to be a, a powerful change agent, I need to talk to everybody, and I need to be engaged in the conversation on all ends. So, you know, and then I think it's, it's, we need to increase sensitivity with law enforcement when victims do come forward. We need to make sure that there's a support person and an advocate at every single entity that a, a victim encounters so that, they're, that they have someone who's informed and who's sensitive. I've done a lot of work with law enforcement, and in my time in Dolphin County Victim Witness, I knew, listen, law enforcement's gonna be the first interaction with a victim. So for me, I knew I needed my advocates there, right? It wasn't about trying to change the mindset of law enforcement. I wasn't trying to change their curriculum. I wasn't trying to make them different people, right? They're law enforcement agency. I'm not gonna turn them into social workers. If I can get a couple, that's great. So I need to make sure I've got my social workers there. So I created law enforcement partnerships in, in Dauphin County where every police department has an, a, an advocate assigned to them, and when they're going and responding to, to victimization and crime, they've got that advocate there. And the advocate deals with the emotional, psychological, financial aspects of the crime, and the officer does what they need to do. So it's creating programs, looking at innovative ways to engage the victim advocacy community with law enforcement and with military, um, and, and it's holding events like this. It's educating people. It's sitting in a room where some of you probably, this is the last place you want to be today. Uh, and I get that. I totally do. I see some heads nod and some smiles. I get it. But it's getting the information. It's educating yourself so that we can slowly make that impact. Again, if you can plant the seed in one person and that one person, it, it takes root and they become a better person, then you've done your job. Yes, sir. I, I try. I do a lot of freshman orientations. Um, I engage social media like crazy, which you know people laugh, but that's where our young people are, right? They're on Twitter, they're on Instagram, they're on Facebook. So it's constantly putting positive messages out there. Um, it's going and speaking. I haven't, unfortunately, been invited to as many schools as I would like. I think we have a long way to go with our middle and high schools. Uh, we did just get a law passed called Aaron's Law in Pennsylvania, which is going to require curriculum, which I believe PCAR is engaged in making sure that that curriculum is, is appropriate. Um, but in, at colleges, I've done, I've spoken at a ton of colleges, um, and I, you know, I have fun with them, and I use kind of silly images, and, and I talk about consent in a different way, um, you know, so that, so that they get it, and I'm very frank with them, and I'm very open, and I'm honest. Um, I think coming in and sharing my own experience helps, because they don't just see me as this professional who's like, you know, the governor appointed her. They, they see me as a person, like I was crackhead, right? I was a rape victim, and they identify with that. Like, I used to cut. I, I had disordered eating, you know, so I, I can speak their language and they get it, but the best part is they see me standing here healthy, whole, happy, successful, and I'm able to parlay that message too. So I mean, that's, that's the way that I try to do it. Um, but again, I use social media a lot too, because um, that's, that's really where they are. Yes, sir. Do your offenders have the right to allocute? At the, like, so do you, uh, when you're at the time of the hearing, do they have the right of allocution? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to have that balance. So if the, if the offender has the right of allocution, that the victim also have the right to speak. So, good. Thank you very much. We were pondering that. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, right now we have a, well, I can tell you one way you can support victims. We have a package of restitution bills that would strengthen restitution. That's a significant, significant barrier for crime victims. If they don't have the financial resources to get counseling, they don't have the ability to, to pay their medical bills. That's significant. So there are a package of five bills um, in terms of restitution. In terms of sexual violence, Delilah. 
Yes, statute of limitations. So there, there is a huge push in Pennsylvania right now, which is finally, I think, starting to garner more support than we've ever had to abolish the statute of limitations. Um, it's really important to understand, and if you even gleaned anything from what I explained to you, you know, the brain doesn't doesn't necessarily experience trauma. There are so many factors as to why people don't report. The worst thing that we can tell a survivor is when they finally get to that brave moment where they're going to disclose to somebody that they have no legal right to do anything. Um, it, it's very damaging, it's very harmful. So statute of limitations would be something that definitely please support, write letters. Um, it, it's significant, um, it, it's very important. We're starting to see a shift nationally too where, where people are abolishing or at least extending it um, further than what we have. For, for in Pennsylvania, criminally, if you have until age of 50 to uh, to report where you can criminally charge, um, which I, I can, you can, you might say, oh, a 50, God, you have your, like your whole life. You, you don't. It's, you know, some survivors, especially given the culture that we're living in now and the dialogue that we're starting to have now, you would be amazed how many um, older Pennsylvanians are coming forward and saying, I was victimized. And then they're in their, you know, 55, they're, they're in their 60s, they're in their 70s, and we're having to tell them, sorry, there's nothing you can do. It's the worst thing you can tell a victim is, sorry, that you have no recourse. No, that statistic does not break down that much, although I have a feeling Dr. Berkowitz may be speaking with you about that a little bit later, but that specific um, study does not break it down into um, repeat offenses. Yes, sir. So... You go to the hospital, right? You're, you're getting a rape exam done. You're experiencing all the very normal reactions that I talked with you about, right? Anxiety, fear, you're on edge, you're hyper aroused, you're vigilant, you're in that state. What's most, what are most doctors gonna do for you? They're gonna pres prescribe you a sedative of some type, right? They're gonna prescribe you Valium or Vicodin or whatever the new oxycodone, oxycontin, right? And, cause it helps take the edge off. And most people, if they don't have any addictive history, like I myself would say, no, thank you, I'm in, I'm in recovery, although I can't tell you how many doctors still say, oh, no, no, this is fine. I'm like, no, you don't get it, I'm in recovery. I don't take anything, you know? Um, but I still, still to this day, have doctors try to push um, narcotics on me. So it starts with that. You take the pill, whew, makes you feel better, right? You can, you can deal, maybe you can actually leave your house that day, you could go back to work, maybe you can attend a class. So you take another pill and then you take another pill, and you develop what's called this chemical dependency on that medication because it helps you feel the way you need to feel. The problem with that is that at some point your doctor's gonna say, well, you know, your, your prescription gets cut off. And what happens then is what's the cheapest, most readily available resource you can get in Pennsylvania? Unfortunately, it's heroin. So we see a lot of individuals whose their addictions start pharmaceutically and they end with heroin because it's, it's easier, it's cheaper, you don't have to go through a doctor and you don't need a prescription to get it. Um, and, and we have a significant heroin epidemic on our hands in, in this state that we need to be really uh, looking at and understanding. And I can tell you um, that a lot of that is directly back, linked back to an initial pharmaceutical. Yeah. So when I share my full story, which obviously I didn't have time to do today, um, I do talk about the fact that I, I was raped at 12 and then I was raped again at 17. Um, I, I was in an environment at a party. I was heavily intoxicated. I was doing drugs. I blacked out. Um, when I woke up the next morning, abundantly clear that I had been raped the night before. So I do. I talk with them about that. I talk with the vulnerabilities. I talk about the vulnerabilities in a way that's non-blaming. Um, but that's important to create awareness, right? Like we have to talk about the vulnerabilities if we're going to even have a remote impact on, 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 on behavior, right? On both ends. Um, so I talk very much about consent, how it cannot be given when, when an individual is blacked out. I talk about the differences between blacking out and passing out. So most people don't understand that there is a significant difference between the two. That people, when they think blacked out, they think of someone just laying on the ground. And that's not the case. When you're in a blackout state, which is, you know, your brain is done, it's offline. You're not reasoning, you're not thinking, you're not conceiving anything, but you could be talking, you could be dancing, you could be running around, but you're not in any way, shape, or form in any state of mind to do anything, especially consent to something like sexual activity. So yeah, I do. I talk about that, um, and I talk about the vulnerabilities and, and the, the frequency. I mean, obviously, 
when I was 12, I had no resources. So the resources I turned to were drugs and alcohol, which then led for me to be putting myself in environments that maybe weren't the best environments. Again, not my fault that somebody took advantage of me in that time, but the reality of where my situation led me and then, and then the realities of the, um, the vulnerability that, that I was in. Yeah, I talk about that a lot. I'm very frank when I tell my story. I don't leave anything out. <laughs> Which is probably why I haven't been invited to a middle school. <laughs> Thank you very much.